has the right to be worshipped except for one God and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon his messengers, his prophets, those that came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, his family, his companions and those that follow in his blessed example until the day of judgment. We ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, in theory, every individual's relationship with their creator is dictated entirely by that which is within their control. In theory, the only way that we view our religion is the way that it was taught by our Prophet, peace be upon him, and not in any other way. In theory, when we meet Muslims or when we meet believers, it brings us closer to our Creator and closer to those that were beloved to our Creator in the past generations because they exemplify the beauty that we seek to discover in our lives. However, all of that is theory. And more likely than not, there are going to be factors on the outside of our relationship with our Creator that are going to drive us to or away from Him. And more often than not, that's people. People that turn us away from our Creator. People that are supposed to be doing that which is righteous but don't exemplify it. People that are supposed to characterize the best of revelation but do not characterize it. And we're turned away. Or we turn others away from our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many different narrations that we could go through and many different ayat and verses of the Qur'an. And a few months ago, and I'm sure that no one else would remember this, but a few months ago, I gave a khutbah about this ayah. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا O oh, our Lord, do not make us a trial for those who don't believe. Meaning, do not let us be a means by which they are turned away for many different reasons. Do not let us be a hindrance, a sadda, a barrier between them and their creator. Do not enable the oppressors and the wicked over us in a way that they would think that they are upon truth and we are upon falsehood. And do not allow us to embody of our faith something which does not be fitted in a way that would turn them away from their creator. However, what about internally? What about someone who already does believe? What about your children? What about your spouses? What about your community members? What about the youth of our community? What about the sisters of our community? What about your brother who's sitting next to you? How do you exemplify Islam to them? And how are you becoming a means by which they come closer to Allah rather than away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And I want to give you a few examples of this from the seerah of our Prophet ﷺ, from the biography of our Messenger ﷺ, as well as from the Qur'an. From the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we find a, a very interesting narration that took place. It's narrated by Abu Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told the Prophet ﷺ that I don't go to the Fajr or I go very late to the Fajr prayer because the one who's leading the Fajr prayer takes too long in his recitation. Now keep in mind here, the Prophet ﷺ said that the most difficult prayers on the hypocrites are Fajr and Isha. And this man says, I don't go because he takes too long in his qira'ah, too long in his recitation. Or I go very late on purpose. Abu Mas'ud says that the Prophet ﷺ gathered the people and his face was full of anger. Now if I was to stop the narration here, you would probably think that the Prophet ﷺ is going to lecture the people in the community about not coming to Fajr on time. And about how they should enjoy their standing in prayer. After all, the Messenger ﷺ was a man that used to stand in prayer until his feet would swell. He was a man that could enjoy hours and hours and hours with the Qur'an and not be fatigued. So you would think that he's going to lecture the people from that standpoint, from that angle of how dare you avoid the salah, how dare you feel an aversion, how dare you not enjoy the long recitation of Salatul Fajr.
But instead, he gathered them alayhi salatu wasalam and he said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, inna minkum munafireen. There are people amongst you that run people away from Allah. There are people amongst you that turn others away from their Lord. Munafireen. Allah says in the Quran, Fafirru ilallah. Flee to Allah. The Prophet said, There are people amongst you that make you flee away from Him. And who was he upset with, alayhi salatu wasalam? The imam or the ma'moon? The one who liked to recite the Qur'an for a long time or the one that could not handle it? The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi was upset with the one who recited the Qur'an for not taking into consideration that person. A very famous incident with Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu where Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, every night he used to go and lead his people in Salat al-Isha. He'd pray Isha with the Messenger وسلم, and then go to his people and lead them in Isha. And this is the greatest faqih of the companions, a scholar of jurisprudence, a mufti amongst the companions. And there was a man that complained that you take too long in your Salah, you lead Salah too long. And when that man complained about that, Mu'adh radiallahu anhu responded, innahu munafiq, he's a hypocrite. Why? Because that's, that's Mu'adh radiallahu anhu's vantage point. What, this man doesn't enjoy the long recitation of the Qur'an? He doesn't enjoy this Salatul Isha? What's wrong with him? And when that reaches the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does he do? Does he call that man to account or does he call Mu'adh radiallahu anhu and say, Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh? Are you becoming a fitna for the people, O Mu'adh? When you lead them in Isha, read, this, read from the Qur'an that which they can handle because you have behind you the elderly and the sick and the weak. You have people that cannot tolerate, that cannot stand all of that recitation. The blame went to Mu'adh. Even though all Mu'adh says with, إِنَّهُ munafiq, He's a hypocrite. And the Prophet ﷺ said the most difficult prayer on the hypocrites is Fajr and Isha. So Mu'adh might be telling the truth, but the Prophet ﷺ ultimately put it on him. You have a responsibility to embody the religion, to exemplify it in a way that you would not run people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would not hinder their relationship with Allah. And he alayhi salatu wasalam also received this message from Allah. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It was only a mercy of your Lord that you showed leniency towards them. That you were lenient with your companions. لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ if you were to be rough in your language, in your character, if you were to be ill-mannered and harsh-hearted, they would have fleed away from you. فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ So be merciful with them. Seek forgiveness for them. And include them in consultation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is speaking to the mercy to the worlds. Allah is speaking to a man that was given miracles upon mir miracle upon miracle upon miracle. Allah is speaking to a man who is extremely effective at calling people to Allah. A man that lived in poverty, a man that had gained the trust of his people for decades, and Allah is saying, even if you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, don't call the people to Allah with good manners, you will run them away. They'll flee from you. And there are many different lessons we can take from this ayah. لَن فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ And Imam al-Suddi rahimahullah said, they would flee from you, not from Allah. They would flee from you, and in fleeing from you, they would also flee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it would have been you that caused the departure, not Allah. So when people have an aversion to Allah, or have an aversion to their Creator, because they come into contact, close contact, with someone who's supposed to be a means of bringing them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they flee away from that person, and flee away from Allah, it's not Allah that caused them to flee away, it's you that caused them to flee away. It's me that caused them to flee away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, even you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you act in a, mean, in, a, in a manner which is not befitting to the truth, 
you will run people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that mean change the religion? Does that mean compromise the principles and the pillars of this religion? No. In fact, it starts off with, and this is very profound, the ulama say if you look at this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off with fadh before ghalid al-qalb. Fadh is in your manners. If you had bad manners, the second one is if you're harsh-hearted. You know why? Because the ulama said even if you have a good heart and even if you have good intentions, if you have bad manners, people won't care if you have a good heart or not. They don't even get to that part. You've already run them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the bad manners. Maybe someone who knows you very well, they can say, well, he has a good heart. Well, you know what? I don't see that. All I see are the bad manners. All I see is the fad part. I don't even need to get to the ghalid al-qalb part. I see the bad tongue, the bad manners. I don't even need to get to the heart part. I'm going to make an assumption based on the bad manners that the heart is also not clean. I'm going to make an assumption based on the abusive tongue that the heart is also abusive. I, don't, I can't even get there yet. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the methodology of calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ud'u ila sabili rabbik, call to the path of your Lord, bil hikmah, with wisdom, and al mawiza al hasana. Good, beautiful preaching. Good, beautiful preaching. Allah did not even mention the substance of the message. Allah did not mention the ilm. Allah mentioned the way you communicate it. Do you communicate it with wisdom? Do you communicate it in a way that's beautiful? Or do you communicate it in a way that would run people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? لو كنت فضن غليظ القلب لن فضو من حولك They would run away from you. Not because the knowledge was not sound. Not because what you were teaching your children was not right. Not because there was something wrong with the message. There was something wrong either in the way you were representing the message in your actions or in the way you were communicating it. Either the verbal communication was off or the actions were a misrepresentation of the message to a point that a person would say, you know, Islam sees okay, it seems okay, but the Muslims not so much. Eventually, that becomes muddied. Eventually, you see it all as one. And the aversion to the people becomes an aversion to the message that those people are supposed to be representing in the first place. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well then this is da'wah, we're talking about imams, the problem is with the imams, the problem is not with us. No, you know what Salama to ibn Dinar radiallahu anhu says about this ayah? Salama ibn Dinar says about the ayah, لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْضًا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضْضُ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were to be harsh in your tongue, bad-mannered or harsh-hearted, they would run away from you. He said the first people that would flee from you would be your family members. It starts off with al-a'ilah. It starts off with your family members. Imagine the pressure and the amount of nonsense that fills the minds of our children as they grow up in this culture. The subliminal messages, sometimes not even so subliminal, that your religion is oppressive and backwards and abusive, that your religion is a hindrance, that your religion is incompatible, with modernity and civilization, that your religion belongs in the caves, and then they come home and dad acts like a caveman. What does that do? It validates each and every single notion that has been put out there about their religion. Because I've seen it. I've seen it. I see it in my parents, maybe. I see it in my brothers and sisters. I see it in the masjid. When I go to the masjid, are people smiling? Are people welcoming? Are people making me feel like the masjid is a place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are welcomed, are made to feel like they belong? Or are they turning me away? Because surely if they're turning me away, maybe that means Allah is turning me away. They ingest it all. Suddenly it all becomes validated. And subhanAllah, psychological study after study shows what? That the way that those who are closest to you, especially in a place of authority, teach you, or the way that you view them is the way that you're going to naturally view God. You're going to view every authority in life in that way. So if the authority figures in my life are abusive and they're not compassionate, 
then surely the ultimate authority is also abusive and not compassionate. And I'll view everything. And no khutbah about Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is going to undo that. That's something that's being ingested and being put into their hearts and minds over and over again and being reinforced over and over again. Ayyuhan nas inna minkum munafireen. You could run people away from Allah, even your own family members. If the way the Qur'an is given to them is in an angry way, in a way that makes them feel like this is a burden, not shifa and nimaf is sudur, then of course, if it doesn't feel like a cure, and it feels like a punishment all the time, and it feels like discipline, of course I'm going to have an aversion to the book of Allah. Of course I won't see it that way. If the sunnah is only exemplified and embodied in a ritualistic fashion, in a way that screams anger, then no hadith of every time I looked at the Prophet Sallallahu face, I saw him smiling, is going to change anything. The sunnah means haram. The sunnah means don't do this, don't do that. The sunnah will be interpreted through my experience, not through what I've heard about the Prophet I'm going to look to the people around me that either claim to be or are claimed to be representing the sunnah of the Prophet And if that's spoiled, then the sunnah will be spoiled in my eyes. That I'm going to see it in a way that's overbearing, that's ugly. But are we compromising? Does that mean you compromise the essence of the message? Does that mean you don't preach what the Prophet ﷺ preached? No, you preach it in a way where you exemplify it so that those that are closest to you will love it. Not just people of other faiths. Those that are closest to you. In fact, Salama to Ibn Dinar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Wallahi, a person of bad manners, even the animals would flee from him. Not only, لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكْ يعني الناس, not only the people, even the animals, everything around you would hate to be around you. It's an overbearing presence. How do you make the people around you? How are we making people that are on the edge feel about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And when someone says, well, it's not our job, they can come to the masjid if they want to come to the masjid. It's not our job to make the masjid feel more welcoming to people. The masjid is the house of Allah. They either like it or they don't. No, it is our job. Because the Prophet ﷺ admonished who? Mu'ath. Admonished who? The Imam and the narration of Abu Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It goes back to us. It goes back to how we're exemplifying it. How we are communicating it. And just as we can do a very poor job of showing da'wah in action to our non-Muslim, to our, to our neighbors of other faiths and our friends of other faiths and people around us, we can also do a very poor job of communicating that to the people that are around us because they will interpret Islam in the way that you embody it, in the way that you exemplify it. And that's why Imam al-Ghazari rahimahullah said, the worst damage that could be done to the religion is a corrupt scholar. The worst damage. There's the saying, Zallatul Alam, that the, the, the fall of a scholar is zallatul, alam, is zallatul Alam, is the fall of the world. Because that's supposed to exemplify faith. When it fails to do the job, the problem is that people often will not be able to separate what is haq, what is truth, and what is falsehood. Is the message itself substantive or not? Is the message worth it or not? And you look back at these narrations and you think about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You think about this hadith of Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the chief rabbi of Medina, when he heard the Prophet Sallallahu for the first time saying, Ayyuhan nas, O people, afshu salam, spread peace amongst yourselves, wa at'im ta'am, and feed the poor amongst you, wa sallu bil-layli wa nasu niyam, and pray at night while other people are sleeping, tadukhul al-jannah to be salam, you would enter paradise in peace. It wasn't just the message. That was the first time he heard the Prophet Sallallahu You imagine the first khutbah he heard from the Prophet Sallallahu were these beautiful words. That's the inauguration speech of the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina. But it wasn't that that won him over. You know what won him over? He said, I looked at his face, فَعَرَفْتُ أَنَّ هَذَا الْوَجْ لَيْسَ بِوَجْهِ كَذَّابٍ I looked at the Prophet Sallallahu face. I looked at the way he was communicating the message. I looked at who he was. And I knew that's not the face of a liar. That man is not a kathab. That man is not a liar. That had just as much of an impact on a scholar of the Torah, a rabbi, 
as the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Because ultimately, it's not just what you learn, it's about what you experience. And it comes back to us as a people. And when the Prophet ﷺ says to us, and I leave you with this hadith, with this thought, when he says to us alayhi salatu wasalam, that a people were drowned because they were on a boat and the people on the upper deck and the people on the lower deck as they were proceeding in their journey, the people on the lower deck had to go up to the people on the upper deck to get their water. And when they go up to the people of the upper deck to get their water, they felt like the people on the upper deck were annoyed by them. They were annoyed by their presence. They didn't tell them, stop coming. No one stands in front of the masjid and says, stop coming to the masjid. No one tells their children, stop being Muslim. No one tells the people that we subconsciously and unintentionally run away from Allah, run away from Allah. They didn't tell the people on the lower deck, stop coming up to the upper deck. But the people on the lower deck did not feel welcomed by those on the upper deck. They didn't feel like they wanted them there. So they said, you know what, we're sick of going up there and getting water from them. Let's just figure it out ourselves. So what did they do? Start to drill holes into the bottom of the boat, into the bottom of that ship, and start to draw water until eventually what happens? It all starts to sink. And then the people on the upper deck are oblivious. They say, what happened, guys? Why did you do that? We were giving you water. What did they respond? Ta'adhaytum bina. You were annoyed by us. So we just felt like we should go ahead and take the water from the bottom. The people on the upper deck, unfortunately, did not realize what was happening until the boat is sinking and the ship is sinking. All of us who would identify as being religious, whatever that means in this day and age, connected to Allah, people of the masjid, people who want to bring people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people who desire that their children and the next generation collectively will hold on to this deen and they will love this deen and they will be proud of this deen and they will be empowered by this deen and they will come to love Allah even more than we have ever loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should want for our children that they are even more connected to their Lord than we are collectively. We hope, we hope that Allah would bring about from this next generation a generation even better than us and a generation that loves Allah even more than we do, and a generation that is connected to their sunnah, connected to this beautiful faith, and empowered by it. But sometimes we're just not paying attention to how we're making them feel when we're giving them that water. And eventually, they'll go looking for it in other places. And when they look for it in other places, because they feel judged, they feel unwelcomed by people of Allah, or those who deem themselves people of Allah, or those who are deemed by others people of Allah. The blame is not on them for digging into the bottom. The blame is on the people on the upper deck for not making them feel welcomed on the upper deck and for not giving them that guidance, for not transferring it to them in a way that they felt empowered by it. That doesn't mean change the religion. Wallahi, it does not mean change anything about our religion. It means we need to think about how we embody it and how we communicate it to those that are in our presence that are Muslim as well. Not just on the outside, those that are Muslim. I should have just as much dedication to each and every single person that prays next to me in this masjid that I do to anyone on the outside of the masjid. On the outside of the masjid. I should have just as much love because you know what? I don't know what experience that person has when they walk through that door. And you know something, subhanAllah, dear brothers, each and every single one of you, dear sisters, each and every single one of you, the person sitting next to you has baggage because you have baggage too. All of us have baggage. And we've all had experiences and difficulties in trying to find our way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of our kids here might have been forced to come to Jum'ah. Some of us felt forced by social pressure to come to Jum'ah or it's become routine. But we're having difficulties in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to figure it out. When you stand up for prayer and you pray next to that person, the way you pray next to that person, the way you smile at that person and say, Salamu alaikum after the prayer, the way you make them feel from the moment that they came in to the moment that they went out, all of that is part of their unique journey to Allah. All of it. And you're either being used to hinder 
or to bring closer. May Allah use you and I to bring people closer to Him and not allow us to be lost in that process. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make Iman beloved to our hearts and make Iman beloved to the hearts of our children and to the hearts of the people around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow us to be a hindrance on anyone else's path to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide through us, rectify us and rectify through us and may, may He forgive us for our shortcomings and not let our own shortcomings be projected onto His perfect religion. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa nisar al-muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah. Allah maghfir al-mu'mineen wa al-mu'minat wa al-muslimin wa al-muslimat al-ahya'i minhum wa al-amwat. Inna ka sami'un qareebun mujibu da'wat. Allah maghfir lana wa arhamna wa a'fu anna wa la tu'adhibna. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasirin. Allahumma aslihna wa aslih bina. Allahumma ahdina wa ahdi bina. Allahumma aghfir li walidina. Rabbi arhamhuma kama rabbawna sigara. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lilmuttaqina imama. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. Allahumma izz al-islam wa al-muslimin wa adhil al-shirk wa al-kathibin wa دمر أعداء الدين اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وإخواننا من بينهم سالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعماء يزد لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة